name is Ali Golding and I'm Director of Movement Works, a UK-based charity. Our aim is to enhance the learning potential of children of all abilities through dance and movement. And we have a recognised specialism for enhancing the development and growth of individuals on the autistic spectrum. Our methods have been recognised by leading experts in this field, such as Dr Stephen Shaw and Temple Grandin. I've really witnessed firsthand the benefits of Movement Works for my class this year. The repetition, routine and structure of each session has really enabled the children to understand expectations, know what to do, therefore giving them a greater level of independence. The sessions include a vast array of sensory elements, therefore meeting a wide range of needs, as well as including cross-curricular links, such as music, numeracy and literacy. It's been a real joy to see the progress that the children have made and they really enjoy each week. I work alongside a child who's um, severely autistic and we've been doing um, autistic dance for about a year now. You know, it's getting him to use different parts of the brain that he wouldn't necessarily be using in lesson. I just feel that it's really made a big difference for um, this child's life. We have been supported by the Royal Society of Arts as a project having real world impact and cited in the report by the All Party Parliamentary Committee for the Arts, Health and Wellbeing. Our work is informed by the latest scientific research and we are contributing to the evidence base with our own studies. You can find out more and support us by visiting our website www.movementworks.org. My name's Ali Golding. Thank you for watching um, the video. I hope that puts today's webinar into context. Um, I would firstly like to thank the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this program possible. And this will be the first of a series of three webinars um, that I'm presenting. So the focus of today is highlighting the things that matter and how movement supports, as I'm speaking as a movement and dance scientist. Um, the webinars are designed to be standalone, so you will get something out of just joining me today. Um, but if you are able and are interested to join for webinar That's two good. and for webinar three, um, that will give you a much deeper understanding uh, of the, the entire topic. So what I'm going to do first of all is to present some relevant perspectives and these are relevant for each one of the webinars that I'm presenting and so we'll be, uh, we'll be introduced in a similar way. Um, then we're going to delve into today the things that matter uh, and how movement supports and then we're going to look at some uh, practical activities, some takeaway activities um, that you can action straight away um, with, your, with your child um, so that this can be a practical help. Um, so I'm happy, I'm happy to go ahead and start if everybody's here. If um, maybe we could just have a look at the first, the very first um, slide. So this is what I'm presenting today. Uh, no, just the, the one that you just had up, the head of slide, yeah. So this is what I'm presenting today. Spotlighting movement during the pandemic the Foundations of Learning, part one. Thank you, we can use that slide now. Um, so movement, uh, no, don't need that one just yet. Uh, movement is at the heart of childhood development and it's much, much more important than most people realize. In special consideration of these unprecedented times of restricted movement and social distancing, it has never been more important to gain a deeper understanding of this topic and to be able to best support all children and in particular children with additional needs who are likely to have missed out on this key area of growth during this period. 
So I do hope everybody is hoping okay. Um, you know, we are in very, very strange times. Um, we are entering into this new normal. Um, and this, this is really about um, the foundations of of learning and, and really highlighting the things that matter here. The, the COVID pandemic has had a massive impact on all of our lifestyles. If you're a parent with a child with additional needs, you may be concerned now that the situation has created even more challenges. But this is a time also as an opportunity to take a broader view on how best to support your child. And perhaps this period of restricted movement has highlighted just how important movement really is and how connected our bodies and our brains truly are. You yourself may have felt more sluggish, more stressed, less focused and even less happy. I certainly have been affected by the situation as much as anybody else. There is some hard science behind all of these symptoms connecting to the lack of movement and if any of them are true for you, movement is even more essential for a child's physical and emotional well-being and for their learning potential. So we're going to consider these relevant yeah. perspectives before we dip uh, a little bit deeper into, um, into the theory and some science. The truth is that even before COVID-19, there was another pandemic affecting the vast majority of us, and the slide's already up there, global um, obesity, including the concerning proportion of childhood obesity. The fact is we all need to eat less and or better and move more. Uh, the percentage of clinically obese children of preschool age is already alarming, and studies suggest as many as 10%, and you can see on that slide, uh, two to four years um, are, uh, yes, two to four years, um, uh, actually that's not, that's, it's okay, we can leave that slide up there, but um, <laughs> I'm referring to another slide, but it's okay. Um, as many as 10% of um, preschool children uh, are, um, are already uh, clinically obese. And there are, there are some new studies suggesting that figure uh, is, is anywhere um, increasing to almost 30%. So this is incredibly alarming. Uh, modern technology minimizes our every action, even prior to the crisis. We struggle to reach the recommended amount of physical activity. And that's the slide that's up. Um, apologies for the confusion. For preschool children, you can see here, we should be aiming in normal circumstances uh, for 180 minutes of physical activity every day. And this, uh, is, this useful reference is from the British Heart Foundation um, and um, you should have it on your handouts too. And you can see that um, we, we're, not, we're, we're nowhere near meeting um, those activity levels at, at any age. So it, it's a problem, inactivity generally is a problem for all of us. If we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Of course, um, keeping a healthy cardiovascular system relies on regular physical activity, combined with other healthy lifestyle choices in our everyday diet, and being conscious of finding the right balance. Um, I've chosen this from the British Nutrition Foundation, and if you look at the activities that they've highlighted, um, there are, they're in three columns. Uh, the first heading is lighter activity, standing up, moving around, playing, walking, songs with actions. Um, more energetic activity. And you can see that here we start to run into a few problems. Running, jumping, skipping, dancing, swimming. Um, some of those are not possible in these current situations. Um, and then active play, even less available to us, riding bikes and scooters, climbing cranes playing in water, chasing games, ball games, all become a little bit more problematic. Um, so, um, because some of these uh, activities are difficult to access at the moment, um, the way we live and the choices we make inside of these restrictions um, can start to be, uh, going back to that positivity, a shift for knowledge and a shift for change. Here we can start to see 
that highlighting dance and dance movements related activity can be a particularly useful resource. Um, and so it's this I'm going to be focusing in on today um, to, um, to assist with some new ideas, uh, to keep us all going um, through and beyond this pandemic. So speaking as a dance scientist, it's not just effective to get us moving more, but it's actually a very potential uh, um, potent learning tool. Um, so we're not only going to focus on um, using dance movement ideas to get our kids active, but actually to help them learn, uh, which is hopefully really exciting to you. All right, so we're going to move on now to the foundations of learning and for me highlighting the things that matter and how movement supports. So as a parent, if missing out on schooling has been a, a primary concern, um, you might be challenged to start shifting your mindset regarding it. Um, this would be true for every child in every part of the world. Coronavirus has affected, but especially uh, for a child with additional needs. And hopefully you saw from the uh, video that we have a specialism uh, for working with children on the autistic spectrum and in fact um, working with children with a variety of additional needs including profound and multiple learning difficulties. No matter what the ability of your child, the foundations of learning need to be in place before any child can access curriculum or engage with what we like to um, think of as kind of formal academic learning. Even for a typically developing child, there will have been a disruption in the natural development. And we need only to look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs to understand how that might be impactful. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. And the next one. Many of you may already be familiar with this framework. But what has changed in the world has disrupted uh, what Vygotsky uh, calls the zone of proximal development. And there are um, references available for anybody who is interested in the academic underpinning. In simple terms, what that means is our comfort zone. So aside from our basic needs being met, which is at the bottom of this pyramid in purple, you can see uh, that uh, the foundations of everything that we need are to do with our physiological needs. So we need to, be, uh, to have enough food, enough water, enough warmth, and enough rest as a baseline. But aside from these, and of course, it's important to highlight that even in itself, some of these for some people will be challenged during this time. Our feeling in the green, our feelings of safety in this pyramid, have been compromised, all of our feelings of safety. And this has a major impact on our ability uh, to what Maslow calls to self-actualise, which in simple terms is just to be able to reach our full potential. So moving up the pyramid, you can see that um, as well as feeling safe, we need to feel, we need to feel that we belong, and we need to feel that we are loved, and then our self-esteem um, and feelings of accomplishment can be established. And only then can we start to um, self-actualize to actually achieve our full potential. Um, the quote by the side of that pyramid is by Adele Diamond. She says, if we want the best academic outcomes, the most efficient and cost-effective route to achieve this is counterintuitively not to narrowly focus on academics, but also to address children's social, emotional, and uh, physical development. During this pandemic, our children, and us as adults and carers, have had these three main areas of fundamental need disrupted, in, namely physical, emotional, and social development has been deprived. I am not alone. Leading UK childhood consultants all agree. Uh, I've recently been um, speaking uh, at a number of um, online, of course, uh, conferences um, with other UK consultants and um, international ones too. 
And we're all in agreement that these are the three things that really matter. And now they need to be taught explicitly with physical development taking centre stage. For children with additional needs, this skill set may already be low or lagging behind. Difficulties with movement and movement processing are synonymous um, with specific or global developmental delay, as movement mirrors the neurological organisation of the brain. So in the second webinar that I will be presenting, we'll look more deeply into that relationship. But the focus here is that dance movement activity used with some understanding can address these three key areas, physical, emotional, and social development. And they can address them simultaneously and be a fantastically impactful approach to work with your child. Far from being an additional burden to fit around the teaching of core curriculum, and rather than thinking that physical activity is something that needs to be addressed separately, by incorporating what I call embodied activities, these can best support learning objectives. And the great thing is that they enhance memory too. So in other words, active learning is the perfect child-centered approach in contrast to learning where you are required to take in information passively, a bit like now, <laughs> which is largely ineffectual, even for older children and adults. So later on, as I mentioned um, in my intro, we will be, uh, I will be getting uh, up uh, out of this chair and, um, and demonstrating and hopefully uh, encouraging you to join in uh, with some fun activities that you can do with your child. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. This is a pyramid of learning, and it's good to reference, uh, to understand, and to visualise the foundations of learning, and the way that academic learning really develops. And as you can see, this is a simplified model um, based on uh, Taylor and Trot. So it comes from an occupational therapy um, field. Uh, which of course is particularly relevant um, to children with additional needs. So you can see at the bottom in the blue, uh, the baseline is sensory integration. Then once that is in place, we can start to develop a body schema and we can start to develop uh, an intentional uh, planning of movement. And then we start to refine that. With uh, coordination skills, further understanding, and that leads to us being able to focus our attention. And of course, without those skills, um, we can't really um, regulate our behaviour very well or um, focus in on formal learning. So, firstly, we all require a sensory rich diet, including full bodied sensory experiences. And this has been the reason that many of us have felt so uncomfortably deprived during the lockdown. And when we are considering the senses, we fully need to comprehend all of that encompassing. So when I say senses to people, most people think of the big five, yeah? So we've got our sight, which is the pilot of our senses, uh, sound, smell, taste, and touch. But that's actually not it. There are at least three more what I call hidden senses, and some would argue there are more than that, but we won't delve into that today. So I'm going to focus in on those, um, because these are particularly relevant um, to this topic and to the ways which you can support the child. The first of them, those are um, vestibular. So we, we can move on to the next slide. The vestibular um, sense, is our body's own, if you like, internal spirit level. You know that tool that's used to um, in building work, in construction work, uh, to find um, the middle point. Could we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, this is where we find um, our balance and our equilibrium. Uh, and then the next hidden sense is 
what we call proprioception. This is the awareness of the position and movement of the body in relation to the external environment. So if you like, as an example, here I am sitting in this chair and I'm getting feedback. I'm getting feedback, I understand that the chair's underneath me, uh, where, the, where the arms are, where the back of the chair is. Um, for children with additional needs, their proprioceptive um, perception uh, may be um, not as uh, refined. And then we have our sense of interoception. This is um, a newly recognised separate sense. And this is the understanding of our body's internal sensations and functions. So, for example, when we feel thirsty, when we feel hungry, um, when we need to go to the bathroom. Uh, and again, this is something that we need to learn. These in internal sensations uh, are something that we, we need to be aware of and, and, and learn. So, we're going to revisit the science behind these senses in, um, in webinar two. We're going to revisit and go deeper. So if you're interested in, in, um, in that, please, please join me next week. Through these sensory experiences, we start to develop uh, what's known as a body schema or internalized map of the body from which we start to plan our movements um, to achieve our needs and desires. We then refine these skills further to achieve coordination of both large, gross motor and small, fine motor physical movements. And with that comes the ability to focus attention and gain deeper awareness. It's only when these foundations are in place that the ability to regulate behaviour and focus on formal learning is possible. The reality is, you cannot force the need to organise the senses. A child has to experience them and gain a perception and understanding of them. So therefore, you can only provide for that knowledge with the appropriate stimulation. Many, and indeed most children with additional or special needs require more or longer and direct intentional experiences to develop this understanding and some of them will have more difficulties or particular deficits in specific areas and they will benefit from a bespoke intervention that's, that's really just for them um, and I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, some uh, questions about, about um, uh, specifics later on. We're going to have a, a Q&A. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide please. So, from an understanding of these foundations of learning, it becomes easier to appreciate that physical development should be at the forefront of our concerns. Dance movement is particularly effective for a number of reasons. Number one, it's a full-bodied sensory experience. So, when we're dancing or doing dance-like movement, we need a... Um, uh, visual processing to go on because it's a visually orientated activity. Uh, I haven't moved on to that yet. Um, we uh, thank you. We it's a, we need oral processing because we normally dance to music, and we certainly have to process instructions. And of course, it's a full-bodied uh, kinesthetic um, activity. So uh, it requires us to interact with the surrounding environment. It's also one of the most complex movement systems that we engage with as a human being, whatever our ability. So dance and dance-like movement is a natural support for coordination development. It can address both gross and fine motor um, domains and we're going to be experiencing that uh, a little bit later. And it's fun. Hopefully you're going to enjoy yourself joining in with me. And therefore, because it's fun, it's intrinsically um, motivating and engaging. And finally, for this particular circumstance especially, it can be an effective activity that's adapted to a large, if you're lucky enough to have a large space available to you, 
but most of us have got limited space and we can adapt to dance and dance movement like activity to limited space much more easily than some of those other activities that were listed earlier on in the, in, in the, uh, in the webinar uh, slide that I shared with you. Related movement activities can support interoceptive, that sense that we were talking about, understanding our body's internal sensations, and self-regulation, which are essential skills for more formal learning to go on. And this links perfectly when we consider how best to support emotional development. So remember I'm talking about the big three, physical being center stage, and next, emotional development. There is an interrelationship between physical development and emotional maturity. The period <laughs> by parents often is frequently called the terrible twos because in the transition from infanthood, young children find it very challenging to control their emotions. And at the same time, they are physically unstable. To highlight this relationship, um, I'm going to um, ask you to consider, it's even in the word, toddler. Consider a toddler. We call them toddlers for a reason. And um, I'm going to ask very kindly if we can now play a very short video, which really highlights um, uh, the way that our toddlers interact with the environment uh, and find their, find their skills of balance. And this is, um, this is highlighted in this video by some adults letting the child lead and copying their movement, which really um, enhances uh, its interaction with the environment. If you could play video two. Children need to be supported with intentional 
social interaction for their healthy growth and development. We may all be relying on technology more and more than ever for our work, for our entertainment, and socialising in a virtual modality. But on an ongoing basis, it's quite tiring. And this is because we do in fact have to use a great deal more effort just to understand each other. Around 55% of our human communication is non-verbal. Just 7% of what we convey is through our words. 38% of our communication is through other vocal elements, and over half, as I said, 55% conveyed through non-verbal elements. So that includes facial expressions, gestures, posture, etc. Of course, this is especially relevant to the current circumstance and the way that we interact with our young children, and especially for children with additional needs, particularly those with speech and language communication difficulties, and those who are pre or non-verbal. And it's never too young and it's never too late to start with some social, physical interaction activities. And I've selected this because again, it really highlights very clearly um, the, the kind of social interaction that's incredibly powerful with very, very young children. So if we could play um, video three, Stop. <laughs> Isn't that such a fun video? Um, so when uh, a, a lot of a lot of parents often say to me, particularly um, when people in in reference to having children with additional needs, you know, my child doesn't follow instructions. My father, my child doesn't understand instructions. That's very very key. No complex instructions are necessary. Dance is a social activity. We enjoy the experience of dancing with other people. Intentional physical interaction with your child can help to support speech, language, communication and social skills, especially where there are no differences. And ironically, during this period of restriction, many children will have benefited from being around adults more for their vocabulary enhancement. So we can afford to worry less about direct language instruction and instead encouraging, like we saw in that video, um, fostering a childlike playfulness at home through move, more movement play and physically interactive fun activities and games. There was a little giggling in that video and laughter itself is also a great physical activity. It improves the whole cardiovascular system and it has additional health benefits, including reducing stress and just generally lifting our spirits. Learning to sign favourite songs and simple nursery rhymes can also simultaneously help language and social development as children will absorb the non-verbal cues and also be supported through the rhythmical structure that are a precursor to speech, particularly useful once again for pre-verbal and non-verbal children, and those who are by a multilingual learners. It's important to remember here that all idioms are culturally specific. So um, while I'm going to um, give you some practical skills uh, uh, and examples, um, feel free to adapt them from a cultural perspective because some of those um, social skills are, are, are culturally specific. So it needs to be relevant to you, your lifestyle and your child. So we're now, um, we're now coming to the end of the um, discussion. 
any just sort of some practical activities. These will be repeated in webinar um, two and webinar three, um, focusing in maybe on some different ones. So I'm going to adjust my screen and stand up um, and, and encourage you to join in with me. Um, and I, I guess we can open the Q&A for some chat uh, at the same time. So we can do what I love to do best, which is, um, which is move and learn at the same time, which is all good. Um, so um, I'm going to adjust my screen now and hopefully, hopefully you can see me. I've got, a, I've got a small bean bag here, but you could use, you could be creative, you could use a ball uh, or a scarf even, uh, anything that's useful around your phone. And all I'm suggesting that you do with your child is as a brain primer, the list of main primers I'm going to do, it's literally just taking to music or to a set rhythm that bean bag or that ball from one hand to the other. You can decide to sing a song while you're doing it or a nursery rhyme. And of course, doing it together is fun. Very, very simple. Yeah. Next one you can do opposite hand to shoulder. Again, nice steady beat to a piece of favourite music or a nursery rhyme, song, and opposite hand to elbow. Great. And then, next on your list you can see, figure eight walking. Now, spatially dependent, we're going to choose a midpoint. I'm going to use my camera as the midpoint. And we're going to do a figure of eight little walk around the room. And what I'm going to try and ask you to do, for joining in with me, is just keep your focus on the middle. As you turn the corner, you're going to still keep the focus in the middle. Yeah? Figure of eight. Depending on your space, you can make that figure of eight bigger or smaller. You can also do it um, with some figure eight swings. So side to side of your body, again going through the middle. Again, steady beat to a lovely piece of music or a favorite song. And figure of eight drawing, perhaps with your index finger. Figure eight drawing, so this is like an eight on the side. So what do all these activities have in common? Next one. Head to tummy. Head to tummy. Or, a little bit more complex, go here. What have all these activities got in common? I'm doing the question. They're all what we call crossing the midline of our body. Um, and again, we're going to be dipping into this uh, much more in webinar two. The relationship of uh, interhemispheric connectivity. So our brain, uh, um, we have two hemispheres, and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, and vice versa. Yeah? So anything that crosses the body midline is really helpful to um, to wake up our brain and get our brain super super connected. Just looking at the chat there to see if we've got uh, any questions. Um, Another fun thing that you can do uh, as a brain primer is to choose three very simple movements. I call it clap, pat, stop. So clapping, this, patting on your thighs, and stomping. Right, left, right, left. So this is a game where you as the adult can be the leader and the child follows. So you might start very simple with just claps. Or then, then pat, 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 pat. Then right, left, right. And then as you have that non-verbal social interaction, uh, you can make that much more complex. So you can start to uh, clap. Stop. Stop. 
creative uh, uh, as you like with, with just those three movements and, um, and really create a great call and response um, uh, communication interaction with your child. So they're my brain primers. Um, we're now going to move on to um, some vestibular activities, activities designed to, um, to really uh, start to stimulate in an appropriate way that vestibular sense. That, that, do you remember what that was? That was that um, uh, equilibrium yeah, and balance. I use the, the idea of a spirit level, yeah? so your child's own internal spirit level. So, um, Consider how this relates, these kind of movements, how they relate to soothing an infant and choose activities that either calm or stimulate depending on the time of day and what kind of response that you want to, to have um, and objectives for, um, for children who have a particular avoidance for some sensory activities or, um, or those who are sensory seekers. Um, so children, children, um, and, and, and that, that can vary from one, um, from one activity to another. So we're going to start with a rocking activity, a very simple rocking activity. So we're standing uh, on two feet or with our arms crossed. If you're, if you're fearful that your, your child has particularly balanced problems, you can do it like I am now, holding onto the wall. You don't necessarily need to grab it, but just, just some fingertips up on the wall will, will, will suffice for getting some, um, some feedback on that. And then all we're going to do is rock up to the balls of our feet and back into our heels. Balls of the feet and back into our heels. And you can make that movement big and then go in a little less and a little less and a little less and a little less until finally come to our own centre of balance. This is a really fun one to do with the toddler. They'll find it quite tricky. Um, another kind of rocking, so we're stimulating the vestibular sense in a different plane now, and it's called aeroplanes. So we can pretend to be aeroplanes, you can do this in place, yeah, or if you have space, you can do it around the room or around a chair. And the final activity that you can do for the vestibular sense is spinning. I call these windmills, and you can have your arms out like this, spin around three times. So we're going to find in the middle each time. So one. Two, three, and stop. And then it's important that we go both ways. Go the other way, and one, two, three, and stop. If you want to level up any of these, you can add an eyes closed option, yeah? An eyes closed option, uh, when we mentioned the senses earlier, the big five, the first one I mentioned was sight. Sight is really, you know, our, our pilot. It's the pilot of all the senses. So when we take our vision away, it highlights all the other senses. And so that can make that activity more challenging uh, and help you to, um, to level up those skills. In the absence of outside playgrounds being accessible, many nursery rhymes support vestibular stimulation. So if we, if we think about um, the activities that occur in playgrounds, they stimulate those three senses. Swings, yeah, the slides, and the wrap. Yeah, that's essentially what they're doing, and that's why children love doing that. In the absence of those, um, they need that vestibular um, uh, stimulation. So, um, a good example of this is a uh, nursery rhyme, uh, row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat, gently down the stream, merrily. Okay, but in order for your child to get that appropriate stimulation, 
stimulation requires this understanding because row, row, row your boat done like this is not stimulating the vestibular system. Yeah? So we need to do the rocking. Row, 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 gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is such a dream. Of course, you don't have to choose that nursery rhyme. Right? It's just an example, but it's the movement that's important. Yeah? The specific movement. Yeah? So, remembering what I was saying about appropriate stimulation and time of day, generally speaking, when we soothe an infant, rocking is quite soothing. We do it instinctively uh, as parents. Yeah? And some Children with autism in particular do lots of self-soothing. So this is what I'm saying about really refining and making it um, bespoke and specific to your child's needs. Spinning tends to be more stimulating. So uh, if you're going to do some spinning activities, and remembering what I was saying about sensory seekers and children who kind of avoid particular um, sensory experiences. So we need to be sensitive to that and choose those activities specifically for your child's needs and at the right times of day. Um, so we're going on now to our um, sense of proprioception, another hidden sense. Uh, and I've just cherry picked a couple of activities um, that you can do with your child to facilitate um, development of proprioception. Uh, the first one I've called tapping body parts and you can do this in so many different ways. It could be done in partners, so uh, you could give uh, a verbal instruction, tap your head, tap your shoulder, tap your arm, yeah, etc, etc. Or as a game, like Simon says, which you can both do. Simon says, uh, rub your knees. Yeah. Simon says, put your hands behind your back. Yeah. So we're getting a sense of our body schema by literally having a direct relationship to our body in some fun games. And of course, you can do it to music as a dance in many, many different The next game I call plasticine people or uh, play-doh people. Yeah? So the leader uh, chooses a shape or a statue to model. And again, you can make this simple or more complex depending on your child's abilities. So uh, this is quite difficult because this is a part you need to demonstrate, but hopefully you'll get a sense of it. So I, as the leader, am going to choose a shape. Here's my shape. And then your partner comes along and by touching body parts, changes your shape. They can do it here, they can do it in your waist, they can do it in your head. So they're literally moulding you into a different shape. Then, you still holding, they have to copy that shape, the one that they end up with, you end up with. So you're both the same now. And then you swap. So then you come out you mould them into a new plasticine person. Yeah? So again, it's a fun game, it's turn-taking, it's socially interactive, and we're developing this uh, body schema. Yeah, fantastic. Any questions? Happy to take questions? Um, okay, so we're moving on to um, now a few ideas for skills of imitation. Imitation is particularly an important um, key developmental milestone, as we all learn by imitation. And lots of the activities already include those, those elements. Um, so I've just cherry picked a few more. Remember, this is not meant to be a definitive list. Um, it's just a springboard uh, for your own creativity. So uh, a very obvious way to improve um, skills of imitation, both visually, I've got visual work, but it's also oral, of course, um, it, on, on various games of um, musical statues. They can be varied to enhance self-regulation, so you can put a favourite piece of music on, dance to 
together, socially interactive, stop the music, freeze, yeah? And you can copy each other's shapes, which includes that element of imitation. If you want to increase self-regulation, you're going to make those whole times a little bit longer. And if you're wanting to level up, and I'm all about this learning while moving, uh, embodied approach, you can start to um, include some more complex constructions. So next time when we stop, for example, we're going to choose a shape that's low to the ground. Um, or we're going to choose a shape that's high, or middle, so you can work with levels, um, and you can obviously make those constructions as, as, as complex as you like to be, particularly job. And then we've got um, a, a, another activity focused more on um, oral imitation. This is particularly good for developing um, listening to instructions and language, speech and language development. I've got a little block here, but you can just as easily clap. Um, so this is a rhythmic call and response, and children love to take notes of this. So I'm going to tap out a rhythm, and then you will be copying. Your turn. And then you can have three turns and, um, and, and, and then take turns, yeah, switching over. Fantastic. And you can see here um, uh, on, the, um, on the handout sheet, um, there are a, a group of children all with additional needs uh, playing that game together and learning to turn take, learning their social skills, refining their, um, their uh, listening skills, so so many benefits from that activity. Uh, we've got a question coming in, uh, children tend to move by nature, do you think to guide them to move more will help them develop more than other children? Well uh, yes children do you know move by nature but we've got we've got lots of challenges at the moment we've got restricted environments and we've got even more emphasis on technology so um many many studies suggest and that's where i started um with uh the relevant perspectives children aren't moving enough um and if they're not moving enough and they're not moving um with uh, very specific um opportunities to develop all of these key skills um, they will there will be deficits and the studies are all suggesting that there are quite a lot of deficits um, when children um, are arriving at school it's, it's, it's actually quite a lot um, over 50 percent and some studies suggest uh, up to 80 and over 80 percent of children are arriving at school with deficits in their physical development which means that they are unable to access the curriculum effectively. So, um, so yes, it is, it is an issue. Um, intrinsically, naturally, children like to move, but we need to provide, um, we need to provide those opportunities. We need to provide um, the right environments for them, even with the challenges that we're currently facing. Um, uh, can see the activities slide for a while now. Is there any other information on movement activities you can share? My voice isn't clear. I'm sorry if the, um, I, I, if the uh, sound is not good. Is that correct? I don't know. I mean, obviously, I can only be hearing my, myself speak. I hope it's, I hope it's good. Um, good enough, anyway. Um, would you like me to, um, we've got, I think, about 10 minutes left. Um, would you like me to go through some more activities, uh, these takeaway activities? Would we like um, more uh, Q&A or a combination as we're doing now? Um, I'm very, very happy to, um, to do either. Uh, I'll carry on for another five minutes and, um, and then we'll, we'll do um, some, some wrap up at the end. So, um, I don't know if the tech team uh, can do anything about the sound. Um, yes, please, some have said, any more activities for overall and fine and gross motor functions? Yes, I can definitely move on to those. 
Um, so um, overall, of this, when we started, um, I highlighted that um, young children uh, should be having, children from around two uh, upwards, should be having 180 minutes of physical activity every day. Um, so uh, I could give you some examples of some really fun activities you can do with your child um, to uh, add to those 180 minutes. Um, one of them I've called I'm the Leader. So a, ch a child picks a piece of music they like and leads the dance for the adult to copy. So um, you saw on that um, really sweet video of the adults copying um, a toddler. Uh, and of course, that could be a turn taking option too. Um, try and use um, music that is um, uh, appealing. And also, obviously, when you're choosing music, um, you want to be choosing music that um, supports that physical activity. So if you'd like your child to be um, moving uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fast and enthusiastic, energetic way, to try and guide them to a piece of music that support that. But if you're, if you're wanting them to develop um, balance and control, then you might also choose a, a slow piece of music. And of course, you can vary as much as you like when you play the game. Um, the other activity I've highlighted under 180 minutes of physical activity is a game called Dance Your Drawing, which I love. So you can put on a piece of music and you each have a, a, a piece of paper uh, and, uh, and a pencil and you just free draw to the music. Yeah? It can be a slow piece of music once again or a fast, energetic one. And you end up, both of you, mark making. Uh, there is no right or wrong. And then you're going to interpret that, um, that drawing or that mark making uh, by physicalizing it. Um, and that could be as creative as you like. Again, there's no right or wrong. Uh, but that's a way of um, supporting fine motor development and mark making and making it into um, a physical uh, activity that you can both join in with together. Um, some more questions coming in. Um, is there any guide to follow activities in order of the age of the child? So all these, all these activities um, can be uh, adapted uh, for infants up until, you know, uh, five years and beyond. Um, obviously, you know, if you're working with uh, an infant, you want to focus in on the kind of simple um, uh, versions of these activities and they're all aimed to be able to be leveled up um, so you saw in that video three that I shared with you, you know, the very very that infant that was on the changing table still joining in with a, a, a version of um, uh, musical statues but just doing it lying down and with the adult leading it they didn't even have any music and it still worked really well um, Overall balance and, co and coordination, yeah, I can answer to that. Somebody's asked, could it be used for an eight-year-old? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And all of these activities are designed to be, um, to be able to be simplified with baseline or leveled up, absolutely. Um, please go to your team and speak. I think that was Can you speak? Yes, I think I am speaking. Um, oh, good. All right. So um, I'm going to. I'm going to. We've got four minutes left. So uh, I'm just going to speak to uh, the question that asked about five motor skills. So I've given you. Um, I've given you something uh, under that under that called um, uh, finger optic. So here we have our fingers, and we can we can go up the octave like this. La 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 and down. La 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 la. It's a very simple. Fun one to do. Um, so, 
look, I believe there's three minutes left. So I'm going to wrap up with some final questions. Um, all of these um, activities, as I say, can be leveled up or down, depending on your child's age and ability. Um, I will be with you again next week. Webinar two is going to focus on the relationship of movement and the brain. And delving into some science behind that, we will, of course, like today, go over some activities. So if you've got some specifics from your handout that you would like me to um, go over that I haven't touched on today, or you have some specific questions, or adaptations you want to ask me, then more the opportunity next week. And then webinar three is going to delve into uh, the Move of Works Development for Dance Movement Program. That's a program I specifically designed, and some movement therapy um, methods uh, that support specifically children with autism, and some other interventions that I haven't had a chance to um, to highlight today. Um, if we can go to the final slide, if that's possible, please. Um, movement Works are providing at the moment a variety of online and offline movement-based sessions that support child development during and beyond this pandemic. So if you have any further questions, um, please you can email info at movementworks.org. You can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter and um, lots and lots of other information and access to the online sessions can be found on the website. So you've got ways of contacting us in between and after these three webinars. Um, I, um, I'm, I can only apologise if the sound hasn't been good and we will try and troubleshoot that um, with the technical team. Thank you very, very much for joining me. I do hope, um, despite the sound difficulties, that it has been um, uh, useful. And uh, as I say, I'm, we're very, very happy to receive uh, emails uh, and any queries also. So um, do fill in your post-webinar questions. I'm sure, um, I'm sure uh, that will be um, really well received um, for, uh, for the support of this series um, so I appreciate you could do that and um, thank you for joining me and I hope to see you uh, all next week